Hello! Um, in this video, I'll be discussing alkanes. So I'm kind of continuing on topic 4. So I think I've discussed basically topic 4a and I'm moving on to topic 4b. So this is also going to be broken into two parts. So part 1 and part 2. And we will be discussing part 1 for today. So I'm going to start off by saying that uh, alkanes are saturated hydrocarbons. Okay, so let's um, kind of dig into what those two words mean. So saturated would be um, there are no carbon-carbon double bonds, okay? Um, there are only single bonds present. So yeah, that is what it means by saturated. So often when you talk about saturated solutions, it means that you cannot add any more solute into that solvent because it is saturated. Yeah, so it's basically that. You can't add any more hydrogens into this compound because it doesn't have any double bonds that you can break and then add hydrogens into it. So, I mean, you'll, you'll we'll get to that reaction, hydrogenation, okay? Um, but yeah, there are no carbon-carbon uh, double bonds. There are only single bonds. That's, that's what saturated means. And hydrocarbons. So what that means is that this compound is only made up with hydrogen and carbon only, okay? So only that word right there is quite important. Um, yeah, and their general formula the for alkanes is CnH2n plus 2, okay? So um, you can just kind of to calculate the molecular formula of an alkane with 25 carbons, for example, you can just put 25 into the N, okay? So you would have C, 25, and then, two, um, and then H, 2 times 25 plus 2. Then you would get um, C25, H52 as your um, molecular formula of an alkane that has 25 carbons, okay? So obviously, um, something more simple, for example, you have, you have methane. Methane only has one carbon, right? If you put one into N, you just get CH4, okay? So I, let's just try um, with different numbers of N and try drawing their structural or display formulas as well, just to check that you did the correct thing. Um, so we also have cycloalkanes. So cycloalkanes are also saturated hydrocarbons, but they have a closed ring structure. Okay, so there is, for example, cyclo cyclopropane, where there are three carbons in a closed ring structure. Um, this is the smallest number of carbons in a cycloalkane, okay? Three carbons. Um, because you can't have a closed ring structure with two carbons, right? So you could have um, cyclopropane, cyclobutane, cyclopentane, and cyclohexane that I drew over here as well. So um, focus on the molecular formula over here. So we have C3H6 and C6H12. Um, you would notice that they don't fit in to the general formula of alkanes, okay? Yeah, so the general formula is CnH2n plus 2, right? It's not gonna, C3H6 doesn't fit in there. So if you have 3 inside n, it would be uh, C3H8. Okay, six times, uh, I mean, three times two is six, plus two would be eight. So it doesn't fit in. Um, C6H12 was the molecular formula for cyclohexane, and we, you can notice that it doesn't fit in there either. So C6, six, um, if you put that into 2n plus two, it would be 12 plus two, so it's 14. C6H14 is not the molecular formula for cyclohexane. So. Um, cycloalkanes actually have the same general formula as alkenes. Um, so the general formula for cycloalkanes and alkenes would be CnH2n, okay? Um, so C3H6 and C6H12 fits in there, right? If you don't know what alkenes are, we'll be discussing that very shortly, so don't worry about it. But just know that the general formula of cycloalkanes is CnH2n. So it has basically two less hydrogens than other alkanes. Um, 
we're going to discuss the uh, concept of structural isomers limited to alkanes though. Um, so let's look at what it means. So it's the compounds that have the same molecular formula but different structural formulas. Okay, so let's look at the structural isomers of C4H10 for example to explore this definition. Um, so first of all, we can have a straight chain um, structure with C4H10, right? Just count the numbers of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms to check. So we have one, two, three, four carbons, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hydrogens, right? So that's a butane, that's a straight chain. The carbon doesn't have any branches, okay? One carbon, um, carbon is bonded to one carbon and then it's bonded to a different carbon bonded to a different carbon so it's a straight chain there are no um, other branches okay and we have this structure where there is a branch so the central carbon is actually bonded to three carbons right so um, this molecule right here let's just count the number of atoms again we have one two three four carbons right and one two three four five six seven eight nine ten hydrogens as well so the molecular formula is the same but the structural formula shown as a display this is a display formula just to make it easier to look at but yeah the structural formulas are different so yeah if you look at the name as well this is butane because it's a straight chain this is going to be two methylpropane because the longest chain is one two three right so that gives probe and um, we have a methyl group on the second carbon so that's two methyl right so the names are also different so for butane, the structural formula, if you want to, if you want to write down as um, a structural formula, would be CH2, I mean CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. And for methylpropane, it would be, um, so there are different ways to write this, but the most simple way to write this is, so H is bonded to this carbon, and then we have three CH3 groups bonded to this carbon, right? So that is a way to write a structural formula for 2-methylpropane, okay? So it, clearly, these structural formulas are different, right? Although they have the same molecular formula. That's why these are structural isomers of each other, okay? Again, compounds that have the same molecular formula but different structural formula, okay? So obviously, the display formula has to be different. Um, all right, so let's look at the isomers of structural isomers of C5H12, starting with this, the most simple one, pentane. So over here, I was too lazy to draw all the bonds of H, uh, C and H, so I just have the straight chain in a structural formula, but showing basically the bonds between carbon, okay? Straight chain, pentane. Um, we can also have 2-methylbutane if I just move one of the methyl groups onto a different carbon in, in the middle, basically. Um, so over here we have the longest chain, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's butane, right? And then we have the methyl group on the, um, oh, we have to count from the different carbon. Um, so 1, 2, 3, 4. So the second carbon has the methyl group and therefore it's 2-methylbutane. And if we have this kind of structure where this carbon is not bonded to any hydrogens but it's only just bonded to CH3 groups, um, it's, so just again, identify the longest chain, one, two, three, and we have two methyl groups on the second carbon, so it's 2,2-dimethylpropane, okay? So 2,2, two, two, indicating the locations of the two methyl groups, dimethyl. Um, so yeah, again, if you wanna check that the number of atoms is um, same as C5H12, uh, you can try and count that. But yeah, these are the structural isomers of pentane, C5H12, okay? There are three. Um, now, lastly, we're going to look at the structural isomers of C6H14. So um, obviously we're gonna have hexane, okay? I simplified it even more um, like that. So CH2, we have C, repeating CH2 four times. That's why it's in brackets and we have four outside the bracket. And we can also have 2-methylpentane, where the methyl group is bonded to the second carbon, okay? 
and we could also have 2,2-dimethylbutane. It's not uh, propane this time. So on the second carbon, we have two methyl groups. And the methyl group can uh, go on the second and third carbons, right? So that would be 2,3-dimethylbutane. So there are four structural isomers for C6H14, okay? Please keep that in mind. And we will look at um, alkanes being fuse, fuels. So alkanes, they are used as fuels in our um, times and crude oils, they undergo fractional distillation first of all, okay? This is, so crude oils, they're mixtures of alkanes of different carbon chain lengths, okay? Um, which have different boiling points. The longer the chain length, the higher the boiling points, okay? And obviously shorter, the lower the boiling point. So longer hydrocarbons with higher, higher boiling points, they're going to be distilled at lower levels of the fractionating column. So if you have the fractionating column, um, your crude oil is just inserted into the, um, the most uh, lower level, the lowest level basically, the bottom, and it's going to be very, very hot in there and because heat is applied from the bottom. Um, and yeah, as you go up the column, it's going to cool down. The temperature becomes lower and therefore um, hydrocarbons with lower boiling points will be distilled off at higher levels. Um, I think that was you know fully described in GCSEs. I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, but if I if you need any help, I can do a video on that. Um, yeah. So, but this is in a nutshell what happens in fractional distillation. Yeah, that's what I just said. And after the alkanes are separated, um, shorter alkanes, they can usually just be used directly. For example, propane, which is only three carbon chain, uh, carbon, carbon length, carbons long, yeah, <laughs> for cooking and heating spaces, just uh, heating it at home, you know. And longer alkanes though, they have limited uses, so they must be cracked. Okay, so um, for example, at lower levels, we can have decane or carb um, alkanes with 12 carbons or 20 carbons even being collected. Okay, so we need to cut those. So um, cracking is the breaking of longer alkanes to produce shorter alkanes using heat. Okay, and we also need ca the catalysts. Okay, we, if we don't have the catalyst, it's we're not going to be able to produce that much heat to crack them. Okay, so we need a catalyst. To list. For example, we can use alumina, which is basically aluminum oxide, aluminum oxide, Al2O3, or silica, which has a chemical formula, SiO2, okay, silicon dioxide. Um, so for example, if we have decane as our long hydrocarbon that has limited uses, we can use heat um, in the presence of the catalyst. We can produce, for example, two ethene molecules and hexane, okay? Hexane, can, um, hexane is one of the main components of petrol, which um, fuels our cars. And ethene is one of, the mo one of the main components in addition polymers. You know, we use this as monomers, for making addition polymers, okay? Um, and sometimes alkanes are reformed, okay? Instead of cracking, we can have some alkanes that are reformed to make them more useful. So for example, we have hexane, okay? Um, hexane could be um, made into cyclohexane. Um, and obviously it's going to be releasing hydrogen because uh, in alkanes, they have two more hydrogens than cycloalkanes. Yeah, so that is going to be your chemical equation right there. You need to know how to write these chemical equations as well. Um, so we, make, we do this because cyclohexane actually promotes smooth combustion inside engines, okay? Which means that it's going to prevent knocking and promote uh, efficient combustion, okay? So there, there won't be um, sudden bursts of you know, combustion of the hexane. So hexane actually is, there's a fly right in front of me. Um, so hexane is actually more flammable than cycloalkane, cyclohexane. Um, so there is a higher chance of 
a, a lot of the hexane just catching on fire at once, meaning that there could be air bubbles and then there's going to be knocking sounds in the um, engine and yeah, that's going to kind of interfere with combustion. So we use cyclohexane, which is a little less uh, flammable. We mix that into the petrol so that it um, gives a smooth combustion, smooth, constant kind of efficient burning, okay? So now we're going to discuss pollutants, okay? Uh, so first of all, we have carbon monoxide. This is produced from incomplete combustion when there is not enough oxygen. And this is problematic because it's toxic. Carbon monoxide is going to irreversibly bind to hemoglobin, um, who delivers oxygen basically. So it's going to disrupt uh, oxygen delivery. So hemoglobin, normally, it's going to have to pick up oxygen in the lungs and then um, bring it around our body and drop it off at respiring tissues. But if it binds with basically carbon monoxide, it's not going to be able to hold oxygen. Okay, it's not going to let go of carbon monoxide either because it's binding irreversibly so that's why it's toxic we won't be able to respire efficiently with carbon monoxide in ourselves and number two we have soot and unburned hydrocarbons so these are also produced from incomplete combustion of fossil fuels and um, alkanes so soot um, is basically just carbon solid by the way it's like graphite um, it can cause visual pollution um, if it's deposited on trees, on buildings, when it becomes very smoky, um, and it can also cause breathing problems. Obviously, if you're breathing in solid particles, it's going to cause breathing problems, right? Um, just as well as unburned hydrocarbons, you don't want to. We don't. We don't want to breathe in gas. Um, gas in terms of like alkanes and. Number three, we have oxides of sulfur and nitrogen. So crude oil, those are fossil fuels, right? Fossil fuels are dead organisms that, that were just buried um, millions and millions of years ago, which had protein in them. They were living organisms, right? They have protein in them like us. Like us. And so therefore we have small amounts of nitrogen and sulfur um, being present in those, you know, crude oil, okay? So nitrogen and sulfur, by the way, if you didn't know, it's elements that are present in protein in addition to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, okay? So therefore, when we burn fossil fuels, you, we might get nitrogen and sulfur reacting with oxygen, okay? And producing sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, okay, oxides of nitrogen. It could be nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide. Um, the X is therefore a variable, okay? So, um, for uh, oxides of nitrogen, so even if we actually remove nitrogen and sulfur from the fossil fuels, the high temperatures in combust engines may provide the high activation energy required for atmospheric nitrogen gas to react with oxygen gas in the atmosphere. Okay, so um, that is going to result in the oxides of nitrogen as well, even if we remove nitrogen and sulfur, okay? So um, yeah, we need a high act, we need a lot of energy to do this actually because of the strong triple bond between the nitrogen atoms in nitrogen gas, okay, in the atmosphere, okay? Um, but yeah, that's provided by car engines because there is such a high temperature. So um, oxides of nitrogen and sulfur are very pro problematic because first of all, they are toxic gases, which can cause breathing problems if we breathe it in, particularly for people who have asthma. And two, um, they can react with oxygen and water in the atmosphere and result in acid rain, okay? So acid rain is very bad because it will disrupt soil pH, which can really damage our crops and damage our agriculture. And it can also go into lakes, ocean, and rivers, which means that it's going to reduce the pH and kill fish and uh, corals and all the other aquatic um, organisms and it can corrode buildings because buildings we use a lot of limestone in buildings um, in 
quite concrete and just, you know, um, we can use some sand and that's all calcium carbonate, okay? Calcium carbonate in um, building materials, they can react with the acid produced from um, the nitrous oxides and sulfur dioxide, okay? Um, which is basically nitric acid and sulfuric acid, okay? So yeah, those were the pollutants and why they are problematic, including carbon monoxide, nitrous oxides, and sulfur dioxide. And next up, we're going to have uh, alkanes part two, which we discuss global warming, so coming with alternative fuels and carbon neutral neutrality and free radical substitution, which involves like curly arrows and everything. So yeah, see you in the next video.